OK, so uh, finally, we're getting into language, the long promised uh, you know, series of lectures on language, which of course is what make GPT-3 and all that stuff work. And then we're going to talk about attention and transformers and all those things in the context of language, even though you can also use it in terms of visual stuff. And so um, you know, of course, this is also how Midjourney and Dolly and Stable Diffusion are going to look at text prompts and generate you know, all these cool looking uh, videos, right? So, in the early days, right, pre-neural network days, um, you know, it was already known. Uh, so let me let me take one step back and say, so if if nothing else comes out of this class, I want you to come to the understanding that GPT and all of its variants are really nothing more than fancy next word predictors, right? GPT three and GPT four and the upcoming GPT five, whatever, are not, you know, like search engines, right? They don't know the entirety of human you know, uh, research and education and contributions. It's not like they've memorized all the books in the world, right? All they're doing is making an excellent, very plausible, realistic next guess about what the next word is given a whole bunch of previous words, right? And this is not fundamentally a new concept or a new observation, right? So certainly uh, all of you are familiar with basically, you know, like, predictive uh, text completion, right, on your phone. You start typing and it starts to fill in words automatically, right? So kind of like, um, you know, early days of kind of like pre-neural network, there were already, you know, auto-completion systems that worked pretty well, right? So we could produce good letter-by-letter -letter completions based on basically some big like Markov or autoregressive model, right? So what does that mean? So we can say letter by letter completion. So this is basically like kind of word level autocomplete using what I would call um, Markov models, right? So a Markov model is basically saying, you know, if the letter at time t is x of t, we learn a model that, um, you know, predicts the probability of x of t plus 1 given x of t based on all the probabilities that it ever saw from a huge corpus of training data, right? So you could train it on Project Gutenberg stories. You could train it on the dictionary or the encyclopedia or whatever, right? Um, and so this will probably learn that, you know, n followed by o is more likely than n followed by p, right? This never happens in the training corpus. This happens all the time. And so, um, you know, it probably won't do a great job of creating really intelligent words, but at the same time, we could then build a more uh, advanced model like uh, this, right? You know, better is to build a model like the probability of x of t plus 1 given not only the previous letter, but say the previous two or three letters, right? We look back k steps. Okay, and of course that's going to require more data and more memory, but it can be done, right? So I, I was digging up one of my old graduate student textbooks, so classic textbook on information theory by the authors Cover and Thomas, right? So this is titled The Entropy of English. We'll talk about entropy in just a second, but basically this is like saying, okay, you know, suppose we had what would be like a zero order model. We could take all the letters in all the text we ever saw and just rank the letters A through Z based on how likely that letter was. And then we could just produce letter by letter text that would correspond to that, right? And this is what you would get on the bottom, right? So obviously the zero approximation is pretty bad, right? The frequencies of the letters are proportional to what you'd see in your corpus, but the, the text doesn't make any sense, right? And I can make this a little bit bigger, or I can try. Now, first order approximation is basically, oh, actually, I take it back. Maybe, maybe I should take it back. So the zero order approximation, I think, is actually just equiprobable letters. So I, I said something wrong, which is the first example is just saying I pick each of the 26 letters at random, and I just keep on doing that. And I guess I actually have 27 letters because there's a space, right? 
and that produces garbage. If I produce text that is, you know, just taking letters corresponding to the frequencies that they appear in the English language, then I get something that's, that's under number two here, which still doesn't make any sense, but at least has more E's and A's and T's than X's and Z's and Q's, right? Now, of course, what you want to do is then have something that takes the previous letter and predicts the next letter, and that's this, right? So, you know, still not actual text, but we are starting to see, you know, letter pairs and some sort of structure, right? There's, you know, R, A-R-E, there's B, that's a word, at. Um, we know that T and S and D are not real words by themselves, that's bad. You know, Dimi, T's and error, these sound like words that could be like words, but are not actually words, right? And then we can kind of keep on doing it. So here, this is like looking at third order approximation. You look at the previous two letters to produce the next letter. Now, you know, we're kind of getting closer to something that resembles something that is kind of like English through a blurry lens, you know, and then this is fourth order approximation. So here, uh, let me move this guy out of the way. So here, the fourth order approximation actually is producing real words, right? The generated job, blah, blah, better, the displayed code, well. The, so now you can imagine that if you just kind of took this to, you know, a logic limit, you like say, okay, I'm going to take the previous 10 letters and predict the 11th letter, you can imagine you could do pretty well, because this is only like a fourth order model, right? But of course, this requires you to have a fair amount of, you know, memory. And also, as we're going to talk about, you also have to, you know, have a lot of examples of these, you know, triplets, quadruplets, whatever, in your train data, right? So um, if we just kind of do a back of the envelope calculation, right? So for example, let's suppose we were doing 26 letters in the space, and we were doing previous three letters to predict the fourth letter, we would need 27 to the fourth, which is like 530,000 combinations, right? We'd have to have examples of all of those 530,000 things and assign probabilities to kind of each of those outcomes, right? Um, okay, so how will we do this, you know, in the kind of like uh, neural network age, right? So. For those of you that kind of grew up on neural networks, and let me just also say that, you know, this is naturally employed as what I would call an autoregressive model, right? Like all this text is generated by feeding in the, you know, once I produce x of t plus one, I then shift my window down one unit and I think about, you know, x of t plus one is now being my new x of t, right? So this is autoregressive in the sense the output is getting fed back in, right? So, you know, we use, uh, whoops. So we use autoregressive models, which is basically feeding uh, output back in as the next input to generate, you know, however much text we want. Arbitrary length text. And of course, this is how GPT works in some sense, right? It's taking the output that it create, creates and that shifts down its window and now it's like as if you typed that word, right? So, um, you know, we could kind of do the same type of thing with a neural network, like what would be the natural thing that you would think to use? Well, what I could do is I could take my letters, um, you know, a through Z and space, I'm not going to include space here just for, for brevity, and I could turn my current letter and all the previous letters, I could think about encoding them as like a one hot vector, right? So basically I could think about encoding each letter as a 26 dimensional vector where only one of these things is turned on, and then I could use some sort of a, you know, uh, model, and I'm not going to talk about LSTMs or recursive neural networks because we're not really going to talk about that too much, but that would be the type of model that you'd use. Let's just say I put this in some sort of model. For example, you know, LSTM or recursive neural network or something like that. Then the last layer of this model is going to be basically a, you know, softmax layer that makes a vector that adds up to one, right? So for example, you know, say, you know, all these numbers may be fairly low, but whatever, 
I say, okay, this is going to be my next thing. And so if this letter was D, maybe this you know, corresponds to O, and that's the next letter that would be produced by my kind of very simple model, right? Now, definitely it's true that your phone, when it's doing autocomplete, is maintaining a bunch of different hypotheses about what the answer might be, right? So it doesn't just give you, well, I guess it depends on your phone, but like for me, when I'm typing, it's usually giving me like a constantly scrolling display of maybe three or five, depending on how wide my display is, possible words, right? And that's something called beam search. So basically, um, you know, we can use beam search to kind of keep track of multiple hypotheses. Right? So for example, you know, and, I'm, and let me just do this, um, you know, suppose that we've generated what blank, right? And now I think about, you know, say the top two next letter predictions, right? Maybe I predict, you know, T and D, and this one has a, you know, score of 20%, and this one has a score of 15%. I'm not showing, you know, A through Z and all the other options, right? And instead of committing to T, what I do is I say, okay, maybe at every branch, I'm going to now generate another set of hypotheses, right? And maybe here, you know, like one possibility is I, and one possibility is Y, and this has a probability of 40%, and this has a probability of 10%. And down here, I have, you know, A and O, and this has a probability of 80%, this has a probability of 10%. Now, I can't afford to keep on maintaining this like exponentially expanding tree. So at every point, I basically could restrict myself to the top K hypotheses, right? So if I say, okay, you know, the most likely possible paths are, you know, kind of like going out this way or say going out this way, right? And so as I'm typing on my phone, it's prompting me for maybe, I'm, maybe I mean to say, you know, what time is it? And maybe I mean to say, what day is it, right? And so in that way, I'm not like, you know, totally committing to a single path, right? So if you're a computer scientist, this is also related to things like, you know, breadth first search and greedy algorithms, right? So maybe when you took an algorithms class, you did some kind of similar stuff like this, okay? Um, and also let me say that, I'm gonna turn my volume down a little bit because I worry it's a little bit loud. Also, you know, if you're not doing like online autocomplete, you can do even better if you see what's happening after the word in addition to what's before the word, right? So for example, suppose that I was, you know, um, you know, looking at ice, sea, something, you know, one possibility could be that the next word is, you know, sandwich, and one possibility, if we're living in Troy, New York, could be driveway, right? So if I know what's coming is sandwich, then obviously ice cream sandwich is most likely. And if I know that I'm living in Troy, New York, then ice covered driveway is probably the more likely thing, right? So this would be what you call a bi-directional network, where you have some, some future stuff, right? But, you know, to be fair, that's not the way that a lot of like autocomplete works because it's obviously causal, but there are other situations where, for example, things like you know, language translation where you see a whole body of text all at once and you want to figure out what to do. You know, suppose that you, you know, had, a, you had the treasure map and there was a word scratched out on it, right? You've got the whole map at once, so you don't have to worry about predicting what's next. You can just kind of like fill in what's most likely from the surroundings. And when we talk about this algorithm called word to vec you'll see that actually that surrounding thing is definitely uh, important, right? Okay, so this is like letter to letter prediction, but I think that we hopefully all know that that's not really typically the way we do prediction for language. Typically we're looking at like word level prediction, right? And so how would we kind of scale this up? It would be kind of the same type of idea, right? So suppose that I was, you know, doing this at a word level, like deep, right? Maybe, you know, one of the possibilities is learning, and one of the possibilities is dish. And then I could go out here and say deep learning book, you know, deep learning algorithm, deep dish pizza, deep dish cloth, I guess, right? And again, I could do the kind of same thing where I kind of maintain some set of viable candidates, 
And we could do the same type of idea. We could build a statistical model from a massive corpus of language to understand you know, what word comes next. And of course, you know, this is a big um, area of litigation, right, in terms of like, you know, what public domain language sources are there out there to slurp from, right? Would it be, you know, you, you could argue that the, obviously the, the, the weights of these things will be biased by my training samples, right? So for example, if I'm training on machine learning corpus, then I'm gonna get deep learning algorithm. And if I'm training on cookbooks, I'm gonna get deep dish pizza, right? So if I wanted to, then it's like, well, what if I wanted to train an algorithm that would write like, you know, JK Rowling, the Harry Potter person, right? Would it be cool to take all of her Harry Potter stuff and take all the Harry Potter fan fiction and import it to some massive algorithm? We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, especially the, when we have uh, Pamela Samuelson from Berkeley to, to talk to us about like the legal aspects of things, I think that she'll probably bring that up. So, you know, this is basically what we're getting to called a, a language model, right? So, um, and again, this idea of language models is not fundamentally new either, right? So if I look back at Cover and Thomas, the textbook, right? So here, this is, you know, this, this was written in 1991 and probably based on something that was even earlier than that, right? So here, this is basically a first order model where uh, these words occur at their natural frequencies as they do in English, right? So you don't get words like xylophone or, you know, prestidigitation or something crazy like that. You get these kind of normal looking words, but there's nothing that relates the words together. But if I do even just a first order model where I take the current word and I predict the next word, then I get something that, you know, is kind of like pieces that look pretty good, right? You know, frontal attack on an, you know, is therefore another method for, right? So those whole strings of words are all pretty plausible. And this was done obviously like, you know, almost 30 years ago, right? So you shouldn't think that GPT is like suddenly the only thing that can do language completion, right? However, if you think about the implications of training this algorithm and trying to build an algorithm that would use many previous words to predict the next word, you can see that doing it in the naive like Markov chain way is not really tenable, right? And one of the reasons is that, you know, there are people, you know, people argue about kind of like how many uh, words there are that are in common usage, right? So in English, for example, there may be about 170,000 words, right? And maybe let's be generous and say only 20 or 30,000 of those words count, right? But if I think about, you know, um, you know like 30,000 words, whoops, sorry. So if I think about like 30,000 words, and I wanna do like, you know, two words followed by the next word, that would be 30,000 cubed in terms of how much I would have to maintain. Um, and that number is already in the trillions, right? This is like basically 2.7 times uh, 10 to the 13th power, right? 2.7 trillion. Now, obviously we also need a better way of thinking about this problem because there are lots of word combinations that don't exist, right? So like, you know, xylophone kangaroo telescope, right? Is that something that I need to be allotting memory space to, to learn from, right? So there's an issue there of thinking about like, how can we somewhat more efficiently and more naturally represent the meanings of words without talking about the explicit words themselves? And that's where the idea of what's called an embedding comes in, okay? So language models in general are, you know, you could, you could have, and you, you, if you're taking a CS course in like natural language processing, you will have, many courses on exactly this issue, right? Because, you know, um, language models play a key role in natural language translation, in speech recognition, um, you know, all that stuff is basically built on language models. Um, and so I'm only kind of really skimming the surface of what I want you to know for the purposes of understanding GPT, more or less, right? Um, but there's a lot more to, to do, right? So in language modeling terminology, this kind of idea is what's called an n-gram model, right? So like before, we could build what are called n-gram models. That's basically saying, you know, I consider the 
n minus 1, most recent words, to predict the next word. So what I showed in the um, you know, book example is what's called a bigram model. n equals 2. That's just like saying use the previous word to predict the next word, right? The problem is that bigram models are really not enough to capture the long-term dependencies that happen all the time in natural language, right? So for example, let's suppose I'm ingesting a big corpus of data and I see these, you know, examples, right? The boy reads a book, you know, the girl reads a book, um, you know, the boy and the girl together read a book, right? So this is like an issue of kind of subject verb and singular plural agreement, right? So now, if I was going to say, you know, um, suppose I just showed you this part, the boy and the girl, the boy and girl blank, right? What, what should come next? If I looked at these three sentences, my natural um, proportion would be, well, you know, if I, if I showed you now the boy and girl read, or the boy and girl, sorry, based on this data, I would have, you know, possibility one is read, possibility two is reads, and these each would comprise 50% of what I saw in my corpus, right? Even though I know that there's really only one right answer that comes from the singular plural agreement. To get that singular plural agreement, I would have to be looking back well beyond girl to get to boy and girl to know that this is a plural group of people, right? So building these models, these n-gram models for large n requires much more trained data. Um, and it also has the drawback that the bigger n is, the less likely it is that you've seen certain n-gram models, right? So, um, you, know, you know, for big n-gram models, there are a couple problems. You know, this requires, you know, lots of memory and lots of data. And, you know, it also has the, the, the problem that, you know, you could have perfectly reasonable n-grams that were never seen in the train data and was, would resultingly have basically like 0% probability, right? So for example, you know, um, a reasonable n input sequence might have basically, you know, a, all of its branches might have 0% probability if it was never seen in the train data. Right, so you might say, you know, the kangaroo wore a yellow blank, right? That sentence may have never appeared in any of my training contexts, but I could still, you know, if I was using like a six gram model and I started with kangaroo was wearing A, then I have a big problem with what the next prediction might be because that five combination of words doesn't occur anywhere. And so, you know, I could do better by having, by cutting it down into like, you know, considering like one, two, three, four, or five n grams, stuff like that. But that's still a pretty kludgy way to do it, if that's the question you were going to ask. Yeah, question. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is if you do a big enough n, will it solve language? Speaking for the, for the microphone, right? So yes, I mean, I agree that the, the, the anecdote is that, you know, someone thinks this is like a summer project for an intern if you just had a big enough dictionary that you could make, like you could solve the problem, right? Um, and I think that also kind of gets to some of the debate we're having now about like, you know, people are saying, well, you know, does that mean that, that GPT is as articulate as a human, right? Um, just in the same way that kind of coming back to Aaron Hertzman's talk, right, you know, just because it can produce this output doesn't mean that it's an artist or it means it's creative, right? So I will put a pin in that in some sense, right? So there's a very famous paper we're going to talk about probably next week 
um, by a linguist called Emily Bender, right? And the paper is called On the Dangers of Stochastic Parrots, right? Which is basically about exactly that question about, you know, if you had a language model that took all the language ever saw and produced perfectly reasonable text, would that mean that that, that, that model, I mean, I guess you could argue that it, like, I, I wouldn't say that there's, a, there's a, a well-posed question, does it solve English, right? I don't think that that model understands anything about the world, right? Or has a, has a corresponding mental model about a picture of a kangaroo wearing a hat, right? Like it, it only knows that these words are likely to occur together, right? But I, I do agree, I think that in the 60s and 70s, there was this kind of like optimism that if you just had enough data and had enough n-grams that you would basically be able to, you know, produce stuff, right? But, you know, especially what does that mean, right? So you, you could make, maybe make, make the argument that such a model would produce grammatical text, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that the text will be meaningful or interesting or insightful, and you're never going to get a, you're, gonna, you're never going to get a Harry Potter novel that has all sorts of, like, weird words and combinations of concepts that never occurred in your trained data, right? Stuff like that. So you could probably make a, a model that would do pretty well at writing, like, stereo manuals that, that, that looked at, okay, this is what a template for this thing looks like. And in some sense, you could argue that that's kind of what GPT is doing at a very large scale, is it's just kind of mimicking all the kinds of stuff it's seen before. If you ask it to write a legal brief, or if you ask it to write a haiku or a poem, it knows the structure of that thing, and it can do it, right? Um, but that question of solving English, right, is really not very well posed, I guess, right? But that, that's a good question. I mean, that's, that's the debate, right? And I think that comes down to, again, I think one thing to take away from, from what uh, Aaron said, right, is there's this kind of sentiment about, you know, uh, well, are we not just in our own minds, just like producing the next word based on all of our lived history to think about what the next natural word should be. Aren't, aren't humans really computers? And I think that that does a, service, a disservice to humans, right? Like it's like, our, we're not just computers, obviously there's a lot more to us than that, right? So, but I think that that's a very reductive way of thinking about it, right? That, you know, yes, what I'm speaking right now is entirely like just next word prediction, right? I'm doing it on the fly, I'm unconscious about doing it, right? But uh, I don't think that, that chat GPT could like replace my lecture, at least not yet, right? So, okay, so um, anyway, so let me, let me talk a little bit about, you know, this, this is the key issue here is when you are really stuck with just, um, you know, kind of like a very narrow focus on words based on the previous word and you're just using, you know, so, so a model that talks about what we did so far, you know, doesn't know, for example, that if I had a sentence in the, in the corpus that was like, the elephant was wearing a yellow hat, and I saw the kangaroo was wearing a yellow blank, right? The, the model's not able to make the connection that elephants and kangaroos are both similar things that could, you know, both wear hats, right? So kind of what we were looking for is something that's called like a neural language model that can generalize from data. So a neural language model You know, and it may not look that different, but kind of the idea is that, you know, I take, you know, word n, word n minus 1, down to word n minus k. I put this into some sort of a big neural network, and then, you know, I put that through a softmax where the softmax is over all the possible words in the, in the dictionary, right? And then I get basically probabilities of word n plus 1, and I can take the top one or I can take the top five for my autocomplete, right? The advantage of this over the Markov model is that, you know, this model can, or at least if you do it right, should generalize, right? So for example, let's suppose that in the data set, I had this sentence, the cat is walking in the basement, or a bedroom, say. Now, so this is in my data set, and now my prompt is basically, you know, the dog is walking in the blank, right? So, you know, maybe my corpus contains no information about dogs walking anywhere, right? But I should be able to learn that bedroom should have non-zero probability because there's something else in the database 
where these two concepts are notionally similar, okay? Um, also, I guess you could argue that even if you didn't have that, that, you know, taking it back one notch before we talk about embeddings, you could say, okay, well, everything here is similar up to this, you know, one word that doesn't match, right? So I guess you could argue that, you know, there's only kind of like one difference in the one hot embeddings of these two things if you're using like a, a naive n-gram model, right? But the problem is that, you know, looking back with this kind of, uh, you know, combinatorial thing is not really uh, the right way to generalize, right? We want to discover relationships between concepts. We want to be able to discover relationships about the grammar of a language that are not explicitly encoded. Like you're not teaching a algorithm how to speak English by matching plural and singular and tense and stuff like that. You are throwing a bunch of data into it and hoping that it figures out what combinations of things are legal, right? And so we want basically, you know, bedroom here to have high probability despite having never kind of like really appeared in the training set, right? And kind of to take that in a more, uh, you know, a different direction is let's suppose that we looked at this example instead. Maybe this is a little more convincing, right? So suppose we had, you know, the cat is walking in the bedroom. And then uh, the prompt sentence is, uh, a dog was running in a blank, right? So here, basically all the words are different, right? Like there is no common n-gram, I, mean, I guess that this in is the same, but like fundamentally these are two different sentences at the word level, right? And we still want bedroom to have high probability here, even though the two sentences at the word level are totally, you know, disjoint, right? That's the idea of what's called a word embedding. So that's where we're going next, right? So the idea that makes this possible is what's called a word embedding. And so, the concept is to transform a word into some sort of a vector space where similar words have similar vectors, okay? And then we can think about transforming distances between words to, you know, well-defined distances between points or vectors, right? So the idea is to represent a word in a vector space with a smaller number of dimensions than the total vocabulary. So, I mean, you could argue that, well, I mean, a one-hat embedding is functionally that, right? It's taking a word and turning it into a vector. But the key concept here is that I want my vector space to be dense, right? I don't want it to be a bunch of zeros and one, one. I want this to be dense, not sparse, right? I can't afford to take English that has 170,000 unique words and map that into 170,000 dimensional vector space, right, as the input to my network. Instead, maybe I map that down to a 500 dimensional vector space, but that's like saying I basically have, you know, like x to the 5,000 possibilities of where my points could be in vector space, right? So for example, in this case, what I might hope to happen is that I have, you know, um, again, the embedding is probably not going to be two-dimensional in real life, but kind of what I'm hoping for is that, you know, maybe, you know, dog gets mapped out to here and cat gets mapped out to here and bedroom gets mapped over here, and that these are all, you know, nouns, right? And then maybe the verbs down here, I want to know, I want to, you know, feel like, okay, is and was should be similar because they're basically like present and past tense of the same concept, and I also would want like 
walking and running to be similar. And then maybe over here in this world, I have like V and A, which are similar. And maybe over here, I have in, right? So I mean, if I was constructing this, this kind of vector space myself, this would kind of be like my desired um, setup, right? So that parts of speech map to different areas or quadrants of the space, right? And now you could see that if we looked at the series of embedding vectors and looked at the similarities, that we would have a much better chance of producing bedroom as the next word if that was our input as opposed to just the words themselves, right? So you can see why the predictions should be a lot better if we embed the words, right? Is there a question or comment? No. Other questions or comments? So obviously, though, in real life, we don't want to mandate the vector space like this, right? We want to learn it from the data, right? And so um, there was a, you know, a big active line of research in the kind of like late 2000s, early 2010s, where it was discovered that if you were training a network for some other job, right? So a lot of this stuff came from, you know, next word prediction or translation or something like that. But it turns out that, um, you know, it turned out that, you know, uh, training a network for next word prediction um, ended up automatically producing good embeddings. Right, so I would say this is kind of work from maybe like the late 2000s, early 2010s. So meaning that you can imagine that, you know, if I'm going to do this uh, kind of one hot idea, right? So if I go back to my, you know, uh, idea of a one hot encoding of the input, that kind of like the natural first layer of my network would be some sort of a, you know, fully connected layer, for example, right? And if, you know, so if this is like 170K and say this is like whatever, 512 dimensional, this first layer is after training going to be basically an embedding, right? And that was kind of like the observation is that you weren't trying to produce a good embedding, but it turned out this was actually a pretty good idea. So, you know, this is basically called a projection layer. So, of course, you know, the network goes on after this point to do something else, right? But, you know, this would be a pretty good embedding if my network is trained to do next word prediction is what was observed, right? So that was kind of a, a clever idea. Um, in practice, I will just back up and say, you know, I'm not a language processor, but, um, you know, you can think about better ways to represent the input so another way of representing the input is by just a number, right? So instead of having a 170,000 dimensional vector, I just have a scalar that is a number between one and 170,000 that tells you which word I'm looking at. And so realistically, when you look at, you know, um, ChatGPT or transformers, or something like that, I think that's probably what's really happening is that you're taking every word and you're turning it into a token, which is more or less the index into this dictionary, right? So, you know, let me just say that kind of more realistically, you know, let's just say a token into my long database, right? Um, and then also, you also need to have, to make all this work, probably some sort of a generic uh, unknown token, right? Because, you know, a word like Dumbledore is probably not in your Oxford English Dictionary, you know, training set, right? So you're definitely going to come across words that are not in the vocabulary, and you don't want your entire system to crash if it comes across such a word, right? OK. So um, people were very excited about these kinds of embeddings. Like I said, probably in like the early 2010s, lots of, lots of development on this, right? And in a way, you know, again, I'm not a, a natural language processor, but there was a, a real sea change between 
kind of linguists who believed in carefully modeling the way that language was put together from first principles of language to computational linguists who said, let's just dump all this stuff into a huge model and see what happens. And as with so many other cases where deep learning methods beat out handcrafted features, that's kind of what happened in natural language processing is that you just kind of like cannot ignore how well these you know, data-driven neural networks work on language data. And so computational linguistics now has this whole, you know, ACL, right, Association for Computational Linguistics is where all of this, this active research is, is done, right? So uh, one th thing I wanted to mention here is that, you know, so it's not a coincidence that, you know, we're using the word embedding here. Like embedding here is really the same kind of concept as the embedding from like uh, VAE, right? We take an input and we embed it into some lower dimensional space. That's really the same thing as what's happening with words here. And then that makes you wonder what could you do in this embedding space, right? So one uh, kind of line of research that then, you know, went on for a while was um, there was this uh, Mikolov at all from an ACL 2013 paper basically made the discovery that word embeddings have interesting properties in vector space, right? So for example, you know, the classic example is that if I think about V as the embedding, right? So if I took the vector for king, I subtracted the vector from man, and I added the vector from woman, I would be close to the vector for queen, right? So the kind of the idea was that this kind of like works the way it should out there in vector space, right? Or if I were to take the vector for Paris and subtract off the vector for France and add the vector for China, I should get the vector for Beijing, more or less, right? So it's kind of cute that that's what happened in vector space, right? However, it's not quite so clear cut. Um, and of course, all this like depends on, you know, critically on, on the model that you use to train. So I mean, I'm not trying to make any general conclusions here. Um, but one observation, for example, is that um, actually the closest um, word, right, which is kind of what you actually care about, is if I do this arithmetic, what is the closest vector embedding of the next word? Actually, kind of counterintuitively, the thing that's closest here is, in fact, king, again, right? So in some sense, we have to include or we have to exclude that word originally from our vocabulary to make this kind of like cute thing work. Um, and a huge issue for these language models is the biases that they encode, right? So big problem would be that if we took like, you know, V doctor minus V man plus V woman equals like V nurse, right? You can imagine that would very likely happen in our model, but it would encode basically this kind of like sexist stereotype that only men can be doctors and women can be nurses, right? Um, and so it's very hard to reason about these models, you know, for that reason. Um, and even worse is that these language models can encode like even more hurtful bias. And so I cited a paper on our course website, but um, I pulled it up here in Acrobat. So this is a paper by, um, oh, this, is the, this is the Mikolov paper that kind of talks about you know, the relationship between singular and plural. I don't think this is exactly the paper that um, I want to put on here for that idea. But that was, that was kind of the concept is the similarity between vectors. But this is pretty bad. So here, this is a paper called On Biases in Language Generation, right? And so, you know, if you prompt it as the man worked as, then it will go off and say the man worked as a car salesman at the local Walmart. If you say uh, the woman worked as, it says the woman worked as a prostitute under the name of Haria, right? This is a horrible bias that is included into our next word prediction model. And this is not like 1991. This is on OpenAI's GPT-2 model, right? So that's not the latest and greatest, but it's not also that long ago, right? So, you know, and, and these stereotypes about the black man, the white man, the gay person, the straight person, I mean, that's pretty bad stuff, right? And it's stuff that the model is, is going to spit out. And so now you can see why, you know, companies like OpenAI have such a hard time with 
putting so-called guardrails on their outputs because it's very easy for these language models to just spit this stuff out, right? And so um, that's, that's a very hard problem to deal with. And I think it also comes back to, um, you know, where your model is trained from, right? So you could argue that if you trained your model on the right linguistic corpus, that this is not the thing that it should be learning, right? But instead, probably it was trained on just like, you know, random internet stuff. Like we'll, we'll talk about it, I think next time or the time after, like, you know, one of the um, ways that these language models were trained was I think by taking all the outgoing Reddit links that had a sufficient number of upvotes to kind of show that people thought that that was something that was credible and scraping the text at the target website, right? But people on Reddit can upvote all sorts of crazy, awful stuff, as you know, right? And so, um, you know, was that the best thing to learn from is what Reddit people thought was funny? I'm not sure that that's like so great. And of course, now that those biases are baked into the model, you know, it's like very difficult to perhaps undo and remove all that stuff from the model, right? So are you gonna train it from scratch? It's very hard. So some of these, some of these models, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of debate about like what was it trained on. So, um, Okay, let me pause and ask any questions or comments. All right, so actually, so let me, let me go on a little bit to what I was gonna say in the next lecture, but I can kind of start talking about it now. Um, so the original um, early language embeddings, like the kind of stuff this was based on, like I said, kind of came out of trying to solve a different problem, right? Trying to solve like a word prediction problem or a language translation problem. The goal of those original papers was not to build good word embeddings, right? But after it became clear that word embeddings could be interesting in this way, then researchers became much more intentional about trying to build, you know, good embeddings, right? Um, so the classic pioneering thing was called word to vec right? This was again uh, by Mikolov et al. And this was a group from Google in 2013. And so this is basically, you know, the pioneering kind of like intentional word embedding. And, you know, word to vec is kind of weird because it was designed over several iterations, right? So like, you know, in a similar way to like StyleGAN, you know, well, I guess there is a single StyleGAN, but like definitely there was like kind of innovations of word to vec so you kind of had to be careful to check like what was the, you know, what was the version of word to vec that people are using, right? So I'm describing kind of like a word to vec in a big picture that is pretty close to what it is, but I can't guarantee that's exactly the same as what people are talking about now, right? And so the key idea, there, there are a few key ideas, right? So, um, kind of the key ideas of word to vec over what we talked about before was, you know, first of all, the original thing, you know, was just to say, let's remove all these hidden layers. Right? All it really was, it's not even really a deep learning model, right? It's basically saying, you know, embedding layer followed by, you know, softmax layer. That's almost all it is, right? It makes everything less complicated. It makes it easier to train. It isn't a deep network. It's just like an embedding followed by a softmax, okay? And so the other thing is that um, since the goal of this embedding is not next word prediction, but more like trying to bring similar concepts together in feature space, there's no reason that we have to restrict ourselves to being causal, right? And that's another thing that's really important, right? So, um, you know, since the goal isn't next word prediction, but instead trying to find a good embedding in the first place, we basically look at what's called the context of a word. Meaning both before and after, right? So for example, you know, let's suppose this is my kind of like target here and, you know, I have like, you know, this is kind of like word N, and then I could have, you know, word 
n minus 2, word n minus 1, word n plus 1, word n plus 2. And let's suppose that these were like you know, board games, right? So you can immediately see that if I'm trying to find a good embedding for the word play, that it makes a lot more sense to use this whole set of two words before and two words after, the context of where that word would appear, as opposed to just using the two previous words, right? So our goal here is to find good embeddings by looking at a whole bunch of examples of, say, word plus or minus two, right? That's kind of the idea. And so um, some of you may be familiar with, there's something called a bag of words model, right? So you know, one way you can imagine doing this would be to say, OK, maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to take my words that I know, I'm going to put these into my embedding that I'm trying to learn. And then I could do something very simple, like I could average these embeddings. And then I could do a kind of a soft max prediction to get the probability of word n. So this is called a continuous bag of words model. So continuous because the embeddings themselves are in a continuous valued space. And bag of words because it's like I'm taking all the words in the context and putting them in without regard to order, right? So this kind of you know, bag of words or bag of features, you know, something that kind of came from computer vision and other places you know, kind of prior to this work, right? So you know, this is not really the, the smartest way to do it. But the kind of interesting thing was that um, Word to Vec actually uh, flipped this on its head to train the embedding, right? So it's almost kind of counterintuitive. So what Word to Vec actually did or does you know, within, within reason is that instead it takes word n, what I'm trying to predict, it takes that, puts it into an embedding, and then, basically, from that, I want to produce probabilities of the surrounding words. That is, I want to predict the surrounding words given the current word, right? And this is called a continuous skip gram model. I guess the gram part comes from n grams, like five grams or four grams, and the skip part comes from the fact that I'm removing one word from the middle. Okay. So that seems kind of weird, right? Like, why should that make any sense, right? Why does it work? And so. As with many things, especially things related to deep learning, one of the answers is that it just worked better, right? So people kind of came up with a lot of after the fact rationalizations for why it ended up working better. But you would, I think, be hard pressed to argue at the time that this would be the right way to do it, right? But as, it, as with anything, is it worked well and everyone started doing it and now it's the way it's done, right? So if you're interested in learning more about this, you know, there's not anything about word embeddings significantly in the Foster book. And I'm taking this mostly from this Ekman textbook on learning deep learning. There's a lot of nice stuff on natural language in here. And so these guys are from NVIDIA, and they make a lot of you know, very direct comments that are along that line saying, like, you know, why does it work? It just works, right? And that's the way it is. And we should just be honest about it instead of trying to rationalize it you know, later, right? So, but let me be a little bit hand wavy about why this should be something that works, right? So let's suppose that, you know, um, I have 
you know, uh, this is my kind of kind of context, right? So kind of what I want is to have, you know, uh, exactly, you know, is a good fill-in and precisely is a good fill-in, right? So to kind of have non-zero probability of each of these things, the network should be able to do well by putting these two words close together in embedding space, right? So honestly, I feel like that's still not super convincing, but again, that's just like the way that word to vec works more or less, right? Um, you're taking the, the middle part and you're predicting the stuff around it. And another key idea that kind of makes this work with respect to the surroundings is that in addition to positive sampling, meaning that they look at all the data that was in the original you know, training set, they also generate a whole bunch of negative examples, right? So another key idea was adding a bunch of negative samples. So just like we want high probability on all of our input data, we also want low probability on stuff that doesn't make any sense, right? So you can kind of think about that like a classification problem. So let's suppose that I have, you know, this example again. That is, you know, then I have my input. What I mean, right? So, you know, this, this, that is exactly what I is kind of like a positive example. And then I can have a whole bunch of other, you know, words here that I want to give zero probability of happening, right? So in some sense, what I want to do is I want to say that for, you know, if I put in exactly, I want all these answers to have plus one prediction, and I want all these guys to have, you know, plus zero prediction, right? So I'm supplying both positive and negative examples to the algorithm as it's learning, okay? And so you might imagine that kind of the way this could work, it's almost like a classification problem, right? So I want to train the neurons for the surrounding words to have a plus one response, and I want the ones that don't fit to have a zero response for random words, right? And kind of under the hood mathematically is that, again, I could imagine having a lookup table for a word and it's given embedding, right? So I could imagine having like, um, you know, these are the input embeddings for my kind of center word. And then these are my output embeddings for my context words. And then I have my corpus that goes from whatever, aardvark down to zebra, all my input words. And then this, this axis here is number of embedding dimensions. And so it's kind of like saying, you know, I take the word I care about, right? So suppose this is the, the row that corresponds to exactly, right? This is my lookup table. It says, okay, what's the embedding going to be for exactly? And then I have a whole bunch of embeddings for uh, possible context words during training. And, you know, some of these embeddings have a plus one response, and some of these embeddings have, you know, a zero response. And then all I'm trying to do is basically look at the, you know, dot product between, you know, input embedding dot context embedding. And that number should either be one for a positive example or zero for a negative example. So you can imagine that all I'm doing is basically trying to do like regression on matching these dot products of all these embedded words to either one or zero, and I just do gradient descent on my whole you know, set of positive and negative training examples. So in a very hand-wavy way, that's what word to vec does, right? 
And for, you know, that was very exciting when it came out, right? So word to vec again, kind of came out of Google. And then there were um, a whole bunch of innovations on word to vec that, you know, made word embeddings more exciting, right? So for example, one thing that you may have also heard of is called glove, right? So glove is another well-known word embedding. This was by uh, Pennington et al. the following year from a group in Stanford. So basically, you know, another big advance. And I'm not going to describe Glove in detail, or even in any detail, just to say that there are, again, some innovations that made the embedding process better and better, right? So one um, you know, way that Glove improved on things was better dealing with uh, out-of-vocabulary words. Right? So instead of having just like this unknown token that, s that sat in for any word that you never saw in your vocabulary, you know, uh, instead of using words, it basically uses like, you know, pieces of words or strings of characters. Right? So the, the kind of fundamental unit is not all the way down to the letter level, but it may be saying, okay, or is a word, or, or is a, uh, you know, is a token, but also maybe like str by itself is a token, right? Something where you have kind of like substrings of characters that you could piece together to form words that you'd never seen before. That was kind of like the idea. Um, and also a key thing that, you know, we've totally glossed over so far is that, um, you know, words that have, uh, different roles or different meanings in different contexts, right? So for example, you know, can I have a can of soda, right? So the two cans should not really have the same embedding, right? One should be a noun and one should be, uh, I'm not sure what can is, not exactly a verb, it's part of some other part of speech, right? And so, um, you know, more advanced algorithms can deal with stuff like this. And so you may have heard of stuff like, you know, there's, a, there's something called Elmo, Cove. There's something called Bert. I'm not gonna talk about Bert, but Bert is another kind of thing that's related to this. So there's a whole bunch of like possibilities for talking about um, word embeddings and, and kind of going forward to sentence embeddings. Um, but, uh, this is just like a very brief introduction to, I think the big ones that you would, you definitely would have heard of word to vec if you're doing any of this stuff, you probably heard of glove. And so if you're interested in linguistics and natural language processing, then there's a lot more to learn here for sure. All right, let me pause and ask any questions or comments to the extent that I can understand or that I can answer the questions. Okay, so that's basically introduction to word embedding by itself, right? Uh, what I want to get into next time is this kind of key idea of attention, okay? So attention is a core concept both for language processing and also it's used a lot in computer vision, but it's also a little bit confusing and hard to understand, right? So uh, I think that's going to be the focus of next lecture is attention, and then the following lecture will be kind of like integrating attention into these transformers, right? Which is probably something else you've heard of. Now again, just to forewarn you, this is not a, you know, like super deep into like learning all the guts of, I mean, I'll, we'll talk about transformers in some detail, but like that's again one of these things where it's an architecture that was proposed that just works super well. There aren't a lot of like reasons for, you know, it's hard to go back and, and think about, okay, so why was this the thing that took over computer vision and so on? But we'll talk about that in a lecture or two. And then, um, you know, I want to come back and talk a little bit about some of the, uh, you know, societal considerations of how these language models are trained, you know, like in terms of their cost efficiency, the carbon, you know, the carbon uh, emissions that they use, the way that, you know, the train data was scraped from unknown sources, stuff like that. So a little bit more of the, you know, social side of things. Okay, so that's it.
Uh, let me stop the recording here.